Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before I introduce today's guest, I just wanted to give you guys a quick bit of, I guess you could call it warning, but more just a, a heads up. Um, my illustrious guest this week, his, his voice is not as strong as it used to be, and we're doing this interview by phone. So I apologize if the audio quality is somewhat subpar, but I think it'll be worth listening to, and I think the audio quality shouldn't be... Uh, too bad. But just in case you're wondering, uh, that's that's those are the circumstances we're recording this interview under. But it should be well worth it uh, because this guest is he's a, he's a giant in American chess. He's been writing for Chess Life magazine for literally as long as I can remember. It's uh, a column called "The Check Is in the Mail" about postal chess. He's an author of uh, over twelve chess books. Um, he's a FIDE master, a correspondence chess master, and he has recently come out with a new book about another giant of American chess, a forebear, you could say, called, uh, the book is called Fred Reinfeld, The Man Who Taught America Chess. It's now available wherever chess books are sold, uh, U.S. chess sales, Amazon, etc. So without further ado, Alex Dunn, thank you for joining us here on Perpetual Chess. Well, we welcome just seeing if you're paying attention. That was a long introduction, but uh, but I'm uh, I'm excited to have you. I mean, you've you, I'm sure you have so many stories to tell, but I feel like the proper place to start is with your newest book. Um, I've been reading it over the past week, and I enjoyed it. I I learned a ton about Fred Reinfeld. It's one of those things where, um, I I've read his books as a kid, and but never really gave thought to to the story behind him. How did uh? How did you have the idea to write about Fred Reinfeld, Alex? Well, like you, I had lots of Reinfeld books, but I came across a book on whales by Fred Reinfeld, and I said, whales? What, what's this chess player doing writing about whales? And then I found out he wrote maybe close to 60 books on topics other than chess, about 100 books on chess, and just an incredible writer, and that got me interested in his life, and got me interested in writing about him. Yeah, just amazingly prolific. I, I couldn't believe it myself, especially when I found out that he died what we would consider these days to be relatively young. He died in his early 50s, um, but to manage to to have that huge output of chess books and books about coin collecting, uh, plus whales, as you say, I mean, who would think it? And and on top of that, as we'll we'll probably discuss, he may have ghostwritten uh, more books. But I thought a good way to to sort of set the scene talking about Fred Reinfeld is to read a little quote from from your book from none other than legendary American Grandmaster Arnold Denker. So Arnold Denker said, now, among masters who used chess for the apolitical purpose of validating themselves as human beings, there were two main groups, the killers and the intellectuals. For the killers, the only important thing was to win, and the end always justified the means. For the intellectuals, winning was important, but so but so were the, the purity and beauty of their creations. High among the intellectuals was a short, pudgy, bespectacled, and very private young man who had one of the zaniest senses of humor, tellingly tinged with acid, that anyone could imagine. His name? Fred Reinfeld. His accomplishment? He sold more books about chess than any other author in Kaisa's long history. Um, and that quote you said was taken from the chess forums at chess.com. Just an amazing quote. And I was thinking about whether it's still true that he's the best selling chess author. What do you think, Alex? Oh, well, I think definitely. Um, he's, his books are still being published and republished. Um, they're being translated into, um, uh, disc from descriptive into algebraic now. So, all the books that he had previously written are being republished. So he's probably heads and tails above number two. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I've heard the the Chess for Dummies and the Idiot's Chess Guide, along with Bobby Fischer's Teacher's Chess, 
rattled off as some of the um, the highest selling chess books of all time. But those are kind of um, each of those authors, you know, they have other books, but nothing on that scale. Um, but in this case, I mean, just the sheer volume of books and the fact that he's he's had so much time to sort of rack up numbers makes me think he's probably the most popular chess author ever. Um, and I learned a lot about his play. Uh, so there were a few things that surprised me about Fred Reinfeld. But other than the whale book, is there anything that surprised you about him once you dug into your research? That's a good question. Let me, let me think for just a second here. Is there anything that surprised me about him? Um, once you... I saw, once I saw what kind of a man he was. That is a very private individual who wrote and wrote and wrote. Uh, it made logical sense what he produced. So no, I won't. I, won't, I, I can't say there's much of a surprise. No. Oh, okay. Well, what surprised me, I'd say. And maybe again, this might be a function of of my own ignorance, but I didn't I didn't know he was such a strong player. Uh, I mean, he beat he had a plus record against Sammy Rashevsky, as you mentioned in the book. Um, beat Arnold Denker himself. Beat Ruben Fine was uh, about number number six in the U.S. Uh, once the rating system came out. Um, so yeah, I should have known this, but as you talk about in the book, Fred Reinfeld he had a family to support, and he dealt with kind of the push and pull of writing sort of the most challenging material he could for the hardcore uh, chess player or writing books that would actually sell. Um, and I think the books that I'd seen were more in the latter category. So for that reason, I didn't realize that he was such a, a, a strong player. Uh, yes, he, he, he seemed to grow stronger the last few years that he played too. Uh, when he finally retired... He had won the uh, the Manhattan Chess Championship, which is roughly equivalent today to uh, uh, the World Open uh, for for its time. Uh, he had won the the uh, Marshall Chess Club the year before, which those two clubs today they don't seem to have a uh, much meaning to players, but they conducted the strongest chess tournaments in the United States. Yeah, one thing that struck me in reading your book was was how sort of uh, New York centric the American chess scene was. Then uh, I feel like that's New York is always going to have a outsized footprint uh, on the American chess scene, but with the rise of St. Louis, that subsided a little bit. But you know, these other names that I, of course, came across as a kid, these other authors such as uh, Al or Israel Horowitz, um, you. And of course, later down the line, someone like Andy Soltis, um, you know, I, uh, I didn't, you, you don't think of them as, as all being sort of in the same circle of friends, but it sounds like basically they, they cross paths often. Yes. Uh, except for Soltis. Soltis was, uh, uh, much later, but, uh, um, Cher- Chernev, Horowitz, uh, and Reinfeld, uh, those names they intertwined. They they wrote together. They uh, worked together, and they were all located in a small area in, in Manhattan. Yeah, and then eventually Reinfeld uh, uh, moved um, to Long Island, uh, where yeah. where he passed away eventually. But um, so when you were researching this project, Alex, so once you decide, okay, you you find the book about. You you come across his name in a book about whales, and it piques your your interest, or you know even um, expand your interest about Fred Reinfeld. Once you decided to write about him, what what was the next step? Well, I'm fortunate to have a very large chess library, um, maybe a little over two thousand regular volumes, and uh, lots of <clears throat> excuse me, lots of newspapers and lots of magazines uh, on chess. So my next step was to start reading the Reinfeld books. Um, I have, uh, I should have counted them, <clears throat> but I have pretty close to 80 or so uh, Reinfeld books. They take up three shelves of my bookcase. So I began reading those and looking at them to get a, a feel of what his writing was like. So that was my next step. <clears throat> 
And what did you what did you take away from reading those books and what I imagine would be, uh, you know, per, at an at a somewhat condensed pace at an accelerated pace? What what was your takeaway when you read them uh, like that? He he was an entertainer, uh, but his 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 entertainment was secondary to teaching chess. Um, he believed that uh, you could teach chess, but put a little sense of humor in there, uh, put a little bit of uh, background information, uh, make it interesting to the reader, and that was key to, to uh, Reinfeld's work, I think. <clears throat> yeah, and from my perspective, my 21st century perspective, I was sort of, I kind of admired his hustle, if you will, like his his ability uh, in terms of uh, business to just pursue what worked and, and to focus on... Um, what what people wanted because it seems to me that before he he may have been one of the first people in the United States to make a living from chess. Um, do you, do you think that that might be true? Um, definitely. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. Sure. <clears throat> that would definitely be true. Um, he did make a living from it. Uh, he 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 learned early, however that his good books, the strong books, the books that would appeal to masters or players that wanted to become masters, those were secondary. The primary books that made him money were the books for beginners. Uh, and those books even still are very readable and very good for beginners today. So what, what, what are your favorite of the Fred Reinfeld books? If you were to recommend one for sort of, as you mentioned, beginner level players and one for more advanced, which, which do you think people uh, could, could benefit the most from these days? Oh my goodness. Cause <laughs> I, I'm my, my books are in my office downstairs. I'm in my office upstairs. So it, it's, um, I mean, his most life. popular is probably the yeah. thousand and one checkmates for, for beginners. Do you think that's that's the best selling one? Well, no, that's definitely one of the better selling of, of his books. But it's not a book you would read; it's a book you would study. Uh, there's very little of Reinfeld in that uh, collection because it's all just diagrams and mate and two, or mate and three, or mate and four, and no comments on the position. So it's very much a book without a personality, but it helps the, the, the student to learn combinations. And what about, can I, you think? I, uh, sure, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, sorry for putting you on the spot with this, but can you think of any of the more advanced levels, uh, level books? Um, are there any that come to mind that, that we could still learn from today? Um, I mean, I know he did a lot of sort of uh, game collection type books. Um. Yes, I think the uh, uh, the Carey's book is is still very much alive because Carey's was a fine attacker, and a lot of his attacking concepts are still uh, playable. The openings have changed, but the combinations and the uh, methods of getting his pieces toward the enemy king are still very much uh, in part and in play today. Okay. So, yeah. I'll, and do you know if that's still in print? Well, as far as I can see, practically all of Reinfeld's books are, are still in print because it said there's a, a translation from descriptive to algebraic. And I, I'm pretty sure the Curie's book is still in print, but I don't know for certain. Okay. I'm trying to, I'm just, taking a look as as we speak. Um, and one other question I had about, uh, oh yeah, it's in print. You can have it at your house in one day. Uh, Carrie's Best Games of Chess, 1931 to uh, 1940 by Fred Reinfeld. Uh, Paul Carries wrote the preface and Sam Sloan wrote the introduction. Um, so there you have it. But one other question I, I had is, um, so we discussed how uh, Fred Reinfeld was the... Um, probably one of the first, if not the first, uh, 
quote unquote chess professional or person to make a living from chess in the United States. Uh, and you mentioned somewhere in the book that, that his book biz- business was quite prosperous. Um, but then there were earlier parts where it sounded like he was really, um, you know, he had to work hard to support his family. So how did he do overall? Like, uh, did he end up um, living a, a pretty good life from, from his book sales? Well, you have to remember, Fred Reinfeldt was born in 1910. That means in 1929, when the Depression hit and the collapse of the U.S. economy, he was just 19 to 20 years old. And so that's that's the age that he starts to play chess professionally. It's the age that he, uh, not, not a few years later, he begins writing the books. So the earliest works are done in Depression times. And really, you don't get out of the Depression, for chess players anyway, until um, the late 30s. And he's he does support his family and makes money, but money was very difficult to come by. Okay, and then in the later years, did he, did he start to, to do better, or was that pretty much the case all along? Well, in the later, in the later years, uh, he was able to move to apparently, and I have not seen this, but apparently a nice home in a good neighborhood and uh, outside of Manhattan. Um, so I, uh, I haven't seen his tax returns, <laughs> but, but uh, just reading what he was doing and where he was and his, his stamp and coin collections would indicate that he was making good money. Yeah. I mean, and he, he worked so hard. His output was just staggering. I mean, so like just to, to put it in perspective, I mean, we, we, we said the number of books. I mean, you said over a hundred chess books, 50 or 50 or more other books, some ghost written books, potentially ghost written chess books. And since he died, I think, was it 54? You said he was in the book. How old he was, was he? He was 54 when he died. Yeah, yeah died 50, 54 when he died. So this is basically all in a 30 to 35-year span. So he might have been even more prolific than uh, recent guest Cyrus Lakdawalla. So um, it, pretty pretty impressive stuff. And, and this is on top of doing lessons and whatever family responsibilities he had. And you had a nice quote from one of his kids somewhere in the book talking about how, how hard he worked, how he basically rose in the morning, went to his office, and was there all day. Um, so, um, I think that on top of what we can learn about him from chess, uh, any, any chess professionals or chess content creators listening can certainly learn from that, from that work ethic. Um, but Alex, I mean, I, I, uh, there's so many other things we have to talk about. So, um, I, I definitely, if you're interested in Fred, Fred Reinfeld, I would encourage listeners to pick up the book. It's a, he's an interesting guy for sure. Um, but we also have to hit some other topics. So of course you're best okay. known for okay. writing about correspondence chess. Um, so my, my first question about correspondence chess, having written the check is in the mail, uh, your column about it, uh, for chess life magazine for, for so many years. Um, and how has, how has correspondence chess changed, uh, over the course of your life? Well, you have to take a look two ways about correspondence chess. The correspondence chess for the, um, lower rated players, the players who have no ambition to be world's chess champion, uh, those players, correspondence chess hasn't changed. The top division has changed radically. Um, the, the use of computers has diminished, in my opinion, correspondence chess. Um, the games are better. The chess is stronger. The computers are wonderful tools to be used. Uh, but the typical tournament where everybody's using a computer is maybe three or four wins and many, 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 many draws. And I think it's, it's, I, I think it's hurt correspondence chess. But as a method of entertainment, as a method of fun, as a method of competition among players who don't have the ambition to be world's chess champion correspondence chess is still alive and well yeah and of course i think most listeners will know but correspondence chess obviously historically was 
postal chess. I actually dabbled in it as a kid because as something I want to talk about later is it wasn't always so easy to find a chess game. So when I was getting into chess in my teenage years, I played a few correspondence games and I remember how exciting it was to get those postcards. But nowadays, a lot of correspondence chess games are played over email. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. E- email has dominated the post office. No question about it. And is there a, a common way for the moves to be transmitted? Like, do you just say the move, or is there a certain interface that correspondence players use to so that uh, your when when your move arrives, you um, you get the position as well in an email? I don't quite understand your question. But yeah, let me answer it. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I didn't fr- <clears throat> phrase it very well. So when when someone ma- you're playing a correspondence game in email, when someone e- emails you their move, does it come with a diagram? Is there like a certain interface that's used to present the move, or is it just like would it just say eighteen dot 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 you know knight f six, and then you would call it up on your own board? Well, in this world of the internet. And this is the world of the internet. Anything can come. You can you can receive just eighteen dot 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 knight to bishop five, or you can receive a diagram. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's servers that enable you to uh, s- sign on, and then you come. Your position comes up. You see your opponent's move, and you make a move just like a regular chessboard, uh, and then that's transmitted to him in the same way. Uh, so. All okay. kinds of things, with it. but so, postal chess, you still find eighteen dot 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 right division four. Okay. And yeah, I was wondering about that because of course a lot of players will know, like a lot of listeners rather will be familiar with playing daily games or games where you move every three days on Lee chess or chess.com. Um, are, are, would those be, would those be considered uh correspondence chess? Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay, and in terms of if you wanted to have those rated by the Correspondence Chess Federation, how how would that work? Well, in order for it to be rated by the U.S. Chess Federation, uh, it has to be played in a tournament sponsored by the U.S. Chess Federation. Um, if, you, if you just play a game online with someone, that's not going to be U.S. rated. Okay, but once you're paired, and I know that you are also a tournament director of Correspondence Chess, once you're paired and you, you uh, correspond with your opponent, um, you can do it. You can play on those interfaces, like Lee Chess and Chess.com? Yes. Okay. Sorry for all the kind of beginner-level questions. My, uh, my Correspondence Chess has fallen off over the years, but uh, so I was just curious uh, how people go about it and, you know, with all of the technological um, conveniences that have come along. Um, so well, it's, it's time to get time to get back into correspondence. Chess, it, you know, it might be. I mean, I do enjoy the daily games uh, because uh, they're they're easier. I'm a, uh, as my regular listeners have heard me talk about. I mean, I'm I'm a working parent, so I don't have a lot of time to sit down and play sort of discrete full games. But I do I do go through spells where I play a lot of daily games, and you know, it's fun to have a a, a rating that that means a little bit more. So. Maybe I will have to get into it, although I'm I'm not sure where I stand, as you mentioned, with computers. Um, I mean, it's changed the game so much where, it, you know, it's... Well, the one thing is if you, if you are basically rated below 2,000, you're not going to meet up with any computers. Let's face it, if, you, if you're rated 15, 1,600, and you have to... Why would you play a computer that's rated 15, 1,600? The computers are going to be rated to, to 2,220 and above. So if you're playing it for for uh, uh, entertainment, relaxation, because you love chess, you, you're not going to meet up with a computer. If you're playing it for a championship where you're going to have to play with master level or above, then, all right, then you might have some problems with the computers. But computers are allowed now for correspondence chess. Is that right? Not not in the U.S. chess. No. Oh, okay. We have, I, I have one tournament called the absolute tournament that is restricted to 13 players and they are allowed to use computers and that's one tournament a year and the other many 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 tournaments that i conduct no computers are not allowed okay and what about like opening books Uh, does that fall under the same category no opening books are allowed uh databases are allowed uh, but any computer that generates moves 
that's not allowed. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so it might be a decent way to 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 brush up on one's opening theory. Um, oh, definitely. That's that's uh, one of the key elements to postal chess is the the fact that you can use published works to strongly develop your game, your opening game. <clears throat> Yeah. So, what do you think? Do you see any other changes in the landscape of postal chess? Is it, uh, or correspondence chess? Is it getting more or less popular? Are there any obvious, other than the obvious um, advent of super strong engines? Are there any other sort of changes on the landscape that you see right now, Alex? Uh, not well. The internet changes everything, and you have lots of correspondence games played on the internet. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. Sure. <clears throat> Lots of correspondence games played on the internet um, in, in various forms. Um, that change dominates the, the correspondence world. I still have lots of players who use postcards or use the U.S. mail. They tend to grow less and less as they... Uh, correspondence chess in the U.S. Chess Federation basically is for old people. <laughs> I hate to say this, but um, probably the average age of my correspondence is 50-some. Okay. I have one or two young players, and everybody else is old. They play it for entertainment and enjoyment. Yeah, so kind of a generational thing, So sort of like um, newspapers. Um I've I've noticed a lot of uh, a lot of the older generation still get subscription newspapers like my dad and my father in law, but but it's uh, it becomes less common the younger you get. Um, yes. Um, but hopefully, I mean, you know, it sounds like it's it's beginning to the correspondence chess generally is beginning to adapt. So hopefully, it can sort of find some partnerships with these online sites and and keep keep the game alive because it is a, it's an interesting form of chess and certainly. Um, has its place in the chess world. Um, so, Alex, a uh, couple other topics I definitely want to want to hit. Um, number one is, uh, in, in addition to your Fred Reinfeld book, I mean, you've written a lot of other books, but one that caught my eye is uh, a book called Great Chess Books of the 20th Century. Um, so, on this podcast, uh, we we have, I think this is episode 132 or something, uh, we've had a few repeat guests, but probably about a hundred twenty different people give book recommendations, something like that. Um, but it struck me that between your library of over two thousand books and the fact that you've written a book about chess books, that you would be a special person to to rattle off a few of your favorites. Oh, I have many, many, many favorite chess books. It's incredible. I um, I very much like the Kasparov series on the world champions uh, that, that I think is a tremendous historical reference and, and readable um, yeah, my... I like I'm sorry go ahead oh I was just going to say yeah I think a lot of listeners it's been recommended of course before because it's it's a modern classic but for anyone wondering the title is My Great Predecessors yes um I like um, uh, I, I like individual books written about a, a player's chess career by that player. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm reading Ivanchuk's book on his career. Um, it doesn't really matter to me whether the player writes well or not. I like to see the games. The games are what counts when it comes to uh, the writing about your career. Um, so er, er, I like everybody from Steinitz to uh, to uh, uh, Carlson uh, when they write about their careers. I'm afraid I don't have much taste, individual taste, in those kind of books. They, they're they all good to me. Whether Even sometimes when the chess is bad, it's interesting to see why, why it's bad, and w- what kind of excuses the player makes, um, I, uh, 
I'm sorry, sometimes my memory laps. Yes, problem, problem, one of the problems about getting old as I am, uh, your memory tends to go a little bit. But um, Yeah, how old are you, Alex? I'm 77. 77. Well, you sound, uh, sound pretty healthy to me. I mean, uh, sound pretty good for 77. Uh, and I saw you mentioned in a previous interview you're a fan of uh, the, the life and games of Mikhail Tal. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I love to watch Tal demolish his opponents. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. And yeah, I, I definitely am. Um, I, I enjoy the biographies, too. So are you enjoying the Ivanchuk book? Yes, very much so. And although it's not a book, I also have uh, recently discovered this new Internet thing uh, where, uh, called YouTube, where they have all these chess games in six, seven, eight minute intervals. That's, that's how long the game lasts that they show it online. And that is fantastic to me too to watch games from Tal Steinitz, Lasker, uh, Capablanca, uh, Carlson played on, on on my television screen and watching the comments made and that I found fascinating too. Yeah, it's a nice and digestible format. Do you have do you, can you think of any of the the YouTube creators in particular? I'm afraid that there's two no, I can't. Okay. Because one, one, one guy that comes on, he tells me his name, but he's got such a thick Slavic accent, I cannot understand it. Right. And and the other guy has a, a, that comes on, uh, it's not a Slavic accent, but it's another accent that I can't quite grasp what he's saying. So unfortunately, these gentlemen. They don't get the credit they deserve. Right. Well, it could be. It sounds like it might be Mato Jelic or uh, uh, yeah, a God. That sounds, that that's, sounds very familiar. Okay. Yeah. Or a God Mater is is probably the most popular. Ch- I don't even know how to say how he pronounces it, but he's probably the most popular uh, YouTuber going these days, and he definitely makes videos that sort of fit that description. They're about ten minutes, give you a little bit of history, and then basically just uh, play through the moves. Uh, he's the guy yep. who always has a dog in the background. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell, but anyway, yeah, it's good that you're adapting to, to the, you know, the modern way of digesting chess games. I I certainly think there's a place for, for everything. Um, so do you have, and, and what about in terms of, so those books can be fun for enjoyment, but as you mentioned, when you talk about Fred Reinfeld, uh, how Fred Reinfeld himself latched on to how he, he quoted him somewhere in the book saying, there's two kinds of, of book readers. There's those who are, are really seeking to improve at chess, and then there's those who are basically reading for enjoyment. Um, and they're kind of, I mean, obviously there's going to be some overlap, but there's a bit of a separate audience. Um, so if if you were to, to recommend something for someone focused more on improvement, can you think of any any books that come straight to mind for that? I should really be downstairs when I'm next to the right <laughs> yeah. books where I look at them. Um, um, well, I think if you're, if you're really looking for improvement, I think the complete chess course by Fred Reinfeld probably is the best. It, it, it combines, is it nine of his books or ten of his books uh, uh, that are written for beginners? Um, and that's that helps a beginning player tremendously, the complete chess course by Fred Reinfeld. That's probably his, um, his magnus opus for beginning players. That's interesting. And you would say it stands the test of time. It's still, still relevant today. Yes. The openings have changed, but the ideas in uh, how to play the game have not. Well, they have a little bit, but not as much. So yes, it's still, the beginner, the, the part of chess has changed is for the upper echelons of chess, the um, the master levels and above. That's where the game has changed the most. The game has not changed much for those players that are be- learning, beginning to learn the game up to 18, 1900. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it in those terms. I would say the study methods, the methods available have changed, but the actual strategy, I don't think, um, has 
has changed that much. And I was just looking it up uh, as we were talking. I mean, it, it looks like it's been reprinted by Russell Enterprises, um, available readily. Uh, and I'm, you know, Alex, I'm rated about 2150 and I'm a scholastic chess teacher. So I probably won't be getting it for myself, but it strikes me that it might be worth checking out for teaching material. Um, do you think it would be a good resource for any uh, chess teachers listening? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, um, again, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, it's excellent for players up to about seventeen, eighteen hundred. Okay. All right. I'm going to order this when we get done with this interview, and uh, listeners, I'll report back what I think. Um, so, but Alex, I, I know that um, your voice is. Uh, I, I don't want your voice to go on us, and I have a lot of topics to discuss. So I, I'm, I saw online there aren't a lot of interviews for you, with you that I was able to track down, considering all that you've done in the chess world. But I did find an old interview from Castle Chess Camp with Bob Ferguson on YouTube, and you, you hinted at some fun stories there. Um, number one thing I learned in that was that it took you 20 years to go from expert to master. Yes, I was rated about 2190. And up to twenty one ninety nine, I probably <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I probably was rated at twenty one ninety nine at least three times. Wow, that's. I think uh... in those days, I think in those days there was a stipulation in the ratings that in order to go from twenty one hundred to a master, you had to play another master or something. I, I believe that was part of the rating system, and most of my tournaments have been local. I, I've always been <clears throat> I've always been pretty much a local person um, because I've had a family, um, wonderful families along the I've been I've been kind of blessed with a number of really fine families and good kids. So I tend to stay at home a lot and I don't travel very far. So most of my tournaments were Binghamton, New York, Binghamton uh, and there's not a lot of real strong players in those areas. So, yeah, I stayed at the same time for a long time. And then you finally broke through, and you've got a USCF high of over 2,400. So yeah. was so yeah. when you finally started, sort of made another push, was there something you did to, to uh, make that breakthrough? I mean, obviously, you have a life pretty much. Um, I mean, uh, I think I think the breakthrough began when I started teaching at chess camps, and the tournaments that the chess camps produced brought in other stronger players for me to play against. Okay, so you played stronger players. Would you guys analyze the games afterward? Mm, no, not huh. usually. So you're left left I, to your I own would devices. Analyze, I would, I would analyze the games. Right. Uh, I think I think the fact that I got stronger competition is what enabled me for my rating to go up. Okay. I mean, but I'm sure there's people listening. All due respect, Alex, that that play stronger players, but feel like they they still don't get better. So, if you think back, is there anything else, any secret sauce that uh, you might be able to share? I mean, obviously, you spend your life immersed in chess, so that's one thing I think <laughs> that probably didn't hurt. I mean, you're reading chess books all the time, have been for decades. Yeah. So uh, sometimes uh, growth is not linear. Sometimes, um, you know, it's just a question. So maybe just infer like uh, knowledge that you had sort of accumulated over the years that you hadn't been able to put to use. But once you played stronger players, you were able to. I'm not sure. Um, do were you doing, do you do a lot of tactics puzzles or did you at this time? Do I do a lot of what puzzles? Like tactics. Were you working on visualization oh. or were you more playing through games? I was more playing through games. Uh, I really think that what caused me to get stronger was the fact that I was facing stronger opposition. Um, if, you, if you like to win and you're fa facing players who are higher rated than you constantly, You've got to learn how to beat them. Yeah, and the, I, there's really no way to do that other than just sort of take your lumps and, you know, keep coming back. Yes, and and I was very fortunate to learn how to beat a lot of players. 
And do you have, is there any particular memory of like uh, being maybe outclassed in a game and then redoubling your efforts and figuring something out from there? Or like a, a more sort of general plateau that you felt you weren't going to break through and you were able to push through? Well, I've always had confidence in my ability to play. Um, from the time I first learned the game, I would go around to try to find players I could do stronger than the players I was playing. But as I said, I was very much restricted to my home, um, <clears throat> my home environment. I never really went any further than 90 miles away to Syracuse or uh, 50 miles away to Binghamton. Those were pretty much the restrictions I had on my chess play. And although there was occasionally a strong player in Syracuse or in Binghamton, there was typically only one. But as I began teaching chess camps, the chess camps acted as a magnet and all of the chess camps always had a tournament at the end of the camp where stronger players would come in. And I began meeting stronger and stronger players. I got stronger and stronger myself. Okay. I guess yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely push push yourself if your listener's looking for advice. Um, and, yeah, again, I still – just listening and trying to sort of piece it together myself because um, – Listeners are always, uh, always looking for for. I mean, there's a lot of people sort of grinding away at chess, and some are showing progress, and some are not. But um, but the, there's certainly a subset of people who who find it hard as an adult to to make progress. But I mean, I I certainly wouldn't underestimate the amount of just reading you do in chess. So I'm sure helping playing the stronger players help for sure. But I also think it might have just been a case where. Um, a, a lifetime of pursuing chess finally paid off. Just just my two cents. But in any event, we've got a few good book recommendations. Um, and what what kind of player were you, are you, Alex? Are you more tactical, positional, or do you consider yourself fairly fairly balanced? Well, right now I love tactics, but tactics are definitely my weakest part. Um, I find that if I'm playing a strong player, I will play positional chess. I will not try to attack I will outlast them and play to win in the end game if I'm playing a player that I think is easier I generally try to generate an attack early and try to win early doesn't always work but that's what I try to do okay makes sense yeah um yeah try to try to play it a little safer against stronger opponents um Okay, so Alex, uh, in your interview with Bob Ferguson that I mentioned, you you mentioned playing ping pong with Bobby Fischer. Yes, yes. So my my first real tournament was uh, Philadelphia, nineteen nineteen fifty six. Is that right? Yes. And um, what I remember about Bobby Fischer was that he crushed a ping pong ball when he lost one game to me. Hmm. I did not like that. Yeah, it wasn't my ping pong. It wasn't it? Wasn't my ping pong ball? But I still didn't like it. That's funny. Yeah, he didn't like to lose, did he? No, no, he didn't. He didn't like to lose. And he won the tournament that year too. So he would have been about thirteen. Um, was he a good ping pong player? Was he a good what? Ping pong player. Oh yes, I I grew up in a ping pong household too, so. I was pretty good at ping pong, and he was pretty good too. Uh, but um, we both tended to lose because we were both about 13, 14 years old, and there were a lot of 17, 16, 17-year-old ping pong players who also were not bad. It was, it was a good time. There was, was a group of us that played ping pong um, in between rounds. That sounds that's an uh, an amazing story. And did you ever cross paths with Fisher in subsequent years as as he as he rose higher and higher in the chess world? I did, but I didn't. Uh, I was um, a small dot on the horizon, so he I won't say he ignored me, but he didn't pay attention. To right? Me. Yeah, not a lot of personal reaction uh, interactions, right. I should say. Um, after that. And what about other sort of uh, brushes with chess legends? I'm always trying to coax stories out of uh, 
out of my guests about uh, uh you know playing world champions or meals or drinks with world champions or um even you know uh esteemed american players do you do you have any other sort of cherished memories from uh yeah, well i i live in a very isolated part of pennsylvania so that's so when i first began playing chess at 13 and 14 years of age i had the fortune of playing arthur Bisquare by correspondence oh fun wow he had a he had an advertisement in chess life at the time I don't remember the money because my parents paid the amount of money. It was probably like five or ten dollars to play them, and uh, that game ended up as a draw. And that kind of, I would say, hooked me at the time that uh, maybe I could play against stronger players. Um, I also played against Larry Evans, but Evans beat me. Oh wow! Players. Yeah, so definitely uh, legends of American chess, and that yeah, that gives perspective of what it was like. Uh, um, Bisguire, like uh, being willing to play people, um, placing ads in Chess Life, and you mentioned uh, also in that interview, I think it was in that interview, that when you as a teenager and you didn't start playing chess until you were a teenager, so um, a- achieved a great deal for what we now consider a late start in chess. But they, you love the game, and but in order to play people, you would go door to door to look for opponents. Yes. Yes, uh, I, and there are three or four chess players in Sarasara's town of about uh, 5,000 people. And um, I would wait. I'd find a rumor to somebody who played chess, and I'd go knock on the door. And, of course, you know, a little 13-year-old kid, 14-year-old kid. Uh, and they were very kind, very receptive, and I played every chess player in the valley i'd guess then then i had to go outside the valley if i wonder if i had stronger players that that's just amazing to think of uh to think of how things have changed i mean i you know i i've told the stories before of how i had to go to a chess club but that that pales in comparison to to going door to door although it is somewhat heartening to hear that it you at least had leads that you weren't cold calling as it were you you had leads that the, the doors you were going to they might be interested in a chess game yes but but still, that that shows how lucky we are to be able to play any time. Um, just roll out of bed and pick up your phone or get on your computer and play a game. Yeah, um, so, uh, chess was not uh, terribly popular in, in in the valleys in the in the early fifties or in the middle fifties. <clears throat> and then, how did you get into chess writing, Alex? Well, that's a good question. Let me think for a second here. <laughs> oh, um, I've always been a writer, even in grade school. Um, I wrote stories, so that's what I knew best was chess. That's what I wrote about. Um, how did I get into professional writing about chess? I started out submitting articles to different chess magazines. Um, there were many in 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 the 1960s. There were a no, quite a number of different correspondence chess magazines in the United States, and I could submit articles to them. Uh, state magazines. Delaware had a, a state chess magazine that I, wrote, that I wrote articles for. Pennsylvania had a state magazine that I wrote articles for. I would submit them uh, you know, um, they could choose to publish it or not. And uh, then, because I was getting uh, a reputation for having these articles published, Chess Life contacted me and they said, how would you like to write an article for Chess, Chess Life? And of course, I said yes. Wow. Do you remember who the editor was at the time? I know we're going way back, so no, no, no worries if you don't. No, not really. Okay, but it must have been an amazing feeling to have them contact you. So the initial, the initial articles being published, were you being compensated for those, or or not at first? Oh, not not at all at first. Wow. So yeah, once again, shows shows the importance of perseverance. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, and then. 
you you ran on to to write for Chess Life for for many decades, and uh, you've you just contributed so much uh, to the chess world. So, Alex, is there uh, is there before I let you go? Is there anything that that you've anything else you'd like to talk about, or do you feel that we've hit sort of the major topics? Well, I think you've kind of hit the major topics. Um, I don't have anything I can, all right of hand that I would uh, want to contribute even more to. Okay. So, no. Okay. Well, I greatly appreciate. First of all, you taking the time for this interview, but but more importantly, just all of your contributions to chess over the years. I mean, starting as you say with uh, writing for free, and then just going to contribute so much to uh, you know chess literature and the the world of postal chess and Chess Life magazine. Um, and I want to thank Dan Lucas for putting us in touch. I mean, it's 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 been a a, a great privilege for me to get to talk to you and get to to hear some of your stories and, and learn more about Fred Reinfeld. Um, Alex, um, if, if any listener were, were to want to reach you, do you, do you, are you willing to share your email address or do you prefer to keep that private? Oh, no, sure. Um, okay. I uh, can include it in the show description. You don't, you don't have to say it if it's the same one. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll put a link if anyone wants to, to email Alex. Um, but yeah, other than that, Alex, just again, I just want to thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and I really appreciate your, uh, your taking the time to do this interview. Oh, this is my fun, too. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, okay, Alex, well, enjoy the rest of your day, and um, and thanks again. Okay, take care, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, Geert Vandervelt for supplying the theme music, my wonderful guests, of course. And I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it's on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, telling an actual friend, an actual person about it. Every little bit helps grow the show. But most of all, I want to thank people who support the show financially. Without your financial support, this show would not be possible. I love doing it, but it is a lot of work. So I most of all want to thank Chessable for their support. And I also would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. And I'd also like to thank the following Patreon partners. You guys are... Aaron Wafflart, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancouge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Bumgardner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect Donnie Ariel, the Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt of Chessable.com, Gerard Barda, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Ogard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, JJ Strand, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Boyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, The Mysterious Moon Master 9000, The Legend Grows, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouge, William Peterson, Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. Catch you guys next week. Yeah.